Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is uh, Sarfraz Ahmed Hasni, and I'm a rheumatologist by training. And uh, currently, I'm working at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, United States. And I'm very thankful to the organizers and very proud and humbled to able to present uh, to my Mera Alma, where I was a um, number of years ago, and a student just like you, sitting in lecture halls and listening to different uh, professors and now I'm um, very honored that I'm in a position where I can come back and give a lecture to my um, uh, the place which uh, taught me a lot. So um, I'm a rheumatologist by training and I will be talking today about uh, some of the problems that you will encounter in clinical practice when patients will be coming to you with joint pain. So um, let's begin and let's start out with the First patient, and this patient uh, is a patient who has who's been who presented to the outpatient clinic, and uh, this is a 60-year-old female with pain in the joints of her hands, and what she's telling you is that she has been complaining of pain when it when she works around in her house and her hand get worse, and usually this happens in the evening. Uh, she, looking at her hands, thinks that her hands are starting to look like how her grandmother's hand looked like. And uh, when you ask her about review system, she denies any other specific complaints such as fever, rash, any diarrhea, any urinary complaints. Uh, when you examine her, you look at uh, her hands and it shows that there are bony enlargements of the bilateral proximal interphalangeal joints and the distal interphalangeal joints or the PIP and the DIP joints of her hands. And when you palpate those joints, you see that there is some tenderness around those joints, but there is no warmth or uh, there is no swelling of these joints. And also when you ask her to uh, try to close her fist, she's able to close her fist completely and the grip of her hand is normal. So this is how her hands look like. And as you can see here, that there is uh, some swelling at the DIP joint, which is the distal interphalangeal joint. And also you can see that there is some swelling at the proximal interphalangeal joint, um, but rest of the joints here look okay. And the metacarpophalangeal joint or the MCP joints look okay too. So uh, you ordered an X-ray uh, and when you do the X-ray, again, you see that the pathology is mostly in the DIP joints here, as you can see that there is destruction of the joints and the joints are not aligned. And same thing is with the PIP joint. Again, there is a destruction of the joint space and the joints are not aligned. And the way we know that is that when you try to uh, uh, run a line, a straight line through the metacarpal bone and then you go through the phalanges, it should be a straight line. But then you can see that there is a deviation around those lines. And then obviously this uh, uh, proximal phalanx, uh, middle phalanx is uh, somewhat deviated to the uh, ulnar side, and then this uh, distal phalanx is somewhat deviated to the radial side uh, of the hand. So um, <clears throat> now you have to think about what is the diagnosis. So uh, if I was in a live audience, I will ask sort of a show of hand, but maybe if you're, you're listening to this recording, uh, just pause for a little bit and think about what we know now and what could be the possible diagnosis. So um, giving you a minute to think about, then let's talk about what are the different etiologies of the joint pain. So the number one uh, question that whenever somebody comes to you with a joint pain is to be answered whether there is uh, the pain is inflammatory or it's a non-inflammatory joint pain. So that is the major question that you have to answer when the pain comes. And then uh, depending on if you have made that diagnosis, whether it's inflammatory versus non-inflammatory, then there are different uh, differential diagnoses, and you kind of go down that path depending on this first major determination. So uh, looking at the differential diagnosis of the joint pain, and of course, this is not a complete exhaustive list. I just picked up a few of the most pertinent ones uh, that I thought maybe I should uh, talk about. But of course, this uh, list is by no way complete, and this is not an exhaustive list. So. Looking on the uh, non-inflammatory sites, the non-inflammatory arthritis are most commonly the osteoarthritis um, or the wear and tear type of arthritis um, and the degenerative arthritis. And sometimes both of them are used interchangeably 
but some people think that osteoarthritis is, is more distinct entity um, when uh, compared with the degenerative arthritis. But uh, in normal clinical practice, most of the time, people will use these terms sort of interchangeably. Uh, then again, the traumatic arthritis, which is a result of uh, either an acute injury or a chronic injury, uh, for example, in certain uh, occupations where they are using some manual labor or some kind of sports where there's a repeated injury or trauma to a specific joint. Uh, for example, um, if somebody's bowling cricket, then they can have uh, traumatic injuries to their shoulder. Or uh, if you are a tennis player, the same thing. And uh, for example, if somebody who is um, a butcher, uh, they will have more pain in their hands because there is a repeated injury or trauma to the joints of the hand. Uh, and then uh, there are certain systemic diseases uh, such as diabetes, uh, thyroid, parathyroid, and other uh, systemic diseases where there could be arthritis secondary to that. Uh, looking at the inflammatory site, uh, which is uh, the other group of the arthritis that we are interested in, uh, the one uh, major category is the non-autoimmune type of arthritis. And here you have septic arthritis, which is uh, due to some kind of infectious disease agent, such as a bacteria or virus or fungus or what have you. Um, and also the other major category is uh, the crystal induced, which are gout and pseudogout. And then there is a large category of the autoimmune diseases where you have joint pain because the immune system is dysfunctional and it is causing damage to the joints. And the most important and the most common example of that is the rheumatoid arthritis. And I think for, the, for practical purpose, the major goal of today's talk is to make sure that you're able to uh, differentiate between what is rheumatoid arthritis versus osteoarthritis. And when you see somebody in the clinic, how do you differentiate between uh, those two types of uh, common arthritis? And some people use these terms interchangeably. Some uh, in the layman's term, they are sometimes being confused. Uh, but as a, a clinician, our job is to make sure that we identify the right type of arthritis and then treat them accordingly. Obviously, the treatment is very different for a non-inflammatory arthritis versus the inflammatory arthritis. And, and that's why we want to make sure that we make this distinction. And not only the treatment is different, the prognosis and the outcomes are also uh, extremely different for both types of arthritis. Um, and the other uh, autoimmune arthritis are, are psoriatic arthritis, ankylizing spondylitis, reactive arthritis, seronegative arthritis, and there's a long list. And again, I uh, just want to reemphasize again that this is not a complete exhaustive list of all types of arthritis. I just picked and chose a few of them that I think are important. So uh, how do you approach a patient with a joint pain? So the important thing, as you will hear in the, in the rounds and when I mean, you go to your clinical wards, uh, always uh, make sure that you listen to the patient, and that is the history. So for the non-inflammatory arthritis, uh, it doesn't have any specific time. So it can happen anytime. Uh, and uh, usually when you ask patients, they will say that the pain is usually worse with the activity. And I just want to make a quick point here is that any type of arthritis will be worse with activity. But uh, there is a distinction between inflammatory and non-inflammatory, whereas uh, initially when uh, they start to do activity, uh, the non-inflammatory type it starts to hurt more. Whereas the inflammatory type, as the patient starts to move around, after the initial uh, some discomfort, it, it actually it, it starts to ease up and get better. Uh, and again, uh, the joints will not be warm and they may have some swelling, but no warmth is noted. And there are also no other systemic complaints. Um, nothing else will be associated or could be associated with the onset of the joint pain. Whereas when you look at the inflammatory type of arthritis, here uh, you will see that usually it is worse in the morning or after inactivity. And usually you will ask the patient and the more important the pain, they will say that they have a lot of a stiffness. So the joint stiffness will be usually about uh, 30 minutes or more. And that's important to identify that if a patient is complaining of a stiffness, how long that stiffness lasts and how uh, it improves with the activity. Because even with the non-inflammatory arthritis, patients may have some joint stiffness, but that stiffness will only last for a few minutes. 
Uh, whereas uh, with inflammatory, the way we make the diagnosis is that the stiffness has to be at least 30 minutes or more. And that's one of the gauge that tells us how severe or how much inflammation is going on. So very important point in history to ask patients about the pain, but also asking them about stiffness. And also uh, the quantification of the stiffness is also very important in, in order to understand how long does it take and how long does it take to get better after the initial degree of stiffness. Uh, and again, the other important point here is to ask about the duration and find out how long uh, the pain has been going on. So for autoimmune diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis, uh, you cannot make a diagnosis until the pain has been present or the symptoms have been present for at least six weeks. And, uh, there, and there is a reason for that because sometimes uh, patients can have uh, syndromes or can have joint involvement that could look like uh, rheumatoid arthritis, but uh, if it is, for example, secondary to a viral infection, it may go away within three to four weeks. So you don't want to prematurely diagnose somebody with rheumatoid arthritis so the pain has to be present or symptoms have to be present for at least six weeks before you can label somebody as having uh, autoimmune related inflammatory arthritis. And also looking at the joints, they're usually warm and swollen. And then you also ask them about any associated symptoms. And most of the time the associated symptoms are present such as they have fever, they have fatigue, they have rash, uh, they have uh, guess, GI complaints, they have GU complaints. Uh, and also they will uh, sometimes would have eye redness, eye involvement is common. For example, in patients who have uh, ankylosing spondylitis or psoriatic arthritis, they will have a uveitis associated with it. Uh, but even in the rheumatoid arthritis, uh, eye involvement can also be there. So you need to ask a good review system and find out if there are any associated symptoms that may give you an idea about what else is going on. So um, having said that, the next, part uh, after the history is the exam part. And now uh, the most important thing about uh, the exam is that you have to uh, recognize the pattern. So the pattern recognition, and what does that mean? So it means that first thing is the number of joints involved. So you want to find out if it is only one joint involvement uh, with the pain, which will be the monoarticular joint. Uh, if there are uh, four or less joints are involved, then these are oligoarticular. And if there are more than four, then it's uh, labeled as polyarticular. So that's the number one thing. The number two thing that you want to find out uh, or uh, help you diagnose is that whether the small joints are involved or the large joints are involved. So the small joints are the joints of the hand, for example, the metacarpophalangeal joint, the PI, in the uh, proximal interphalangeal joint or PIP joint, or the distal interphalangeal joint or the DIP joint in the hand. And similarly, in the foot, then you have the metatarsophalangeal joint or the MTP joint. Uh, and those joints are the small joints of the hand. And then you also look at the large joints, such as the knee, the hip, the elbow, and what have you. Um, and then also the other uh, part is to look at the, whether the joint pain is symmetrical or non-symmetrical. So whether both hands are involved or only one hand is involved and the knee is involved, uh, so those are also important to recognize. And then the other things, uh, in addition to the pattern recognition, is to uh, look at the redness, warmth, and swelling. So, so the first thing about, uh, the important thing in history is to find out about morning stiffness and the duration, if the stiffness is present for 30 minutes or more, and if the duration of the symptoms are six weeks or more. Then on the exam, you want to look at the pattern. So you want to find out the numbers of joint, mono versus oligo or polyarticular, and the size of the joint, whether it's small or large, and then uh, whether it's symmetrical or non-symmetrical. And then you also want to look if there's any redness, warmth or swelling of the joint. And then last but not least is to look at the deformities, whether the joints are deformed. If you can see, obviously see that the joints are uh, not aligned and they're reformed and if there is any associated uh, atrophy of the muscles and if there is any associated tenderness uh, of the joint. So, so those will be the important things. And then um, if there are large joints are involved with the back is involved, then you want to make sure that the gait of the patient uh, is okay or not. And then you ask the patients to get up and then walk. Uh, and this is also important in terms of the exam. 
And uh, last thing about the exam is to see the range of motion. So now you want to see if uh, patient is able to, for example, make a fist or is able to move her arms or his arms or you know, walk around. And then you also want to do a passive range of motion where you do the range of motion. And then you want to see if, what is the difference between when the patient does it, which is the active range of motion, and when you do the range of motion, which is the passive range of motion. So those will be the things in the exam. Now, um, when now we have this uh, better understanding about uh, some of the important things in terms of the differential diagnosis, whether it's inflammatory or non-inflammatory, and then how we will ask questions in the history that will help us go down one path versus other, and what are the things that we are looking at in exam uh, to find out whether uh, it's an inflammatory or, or non-inflammatory. So with this now knowledge, now uh, you, know, you know about joint pain. Now let's go back to the patient and see uh, how do we diagnose this patient. So again, if you recall, the patient was this 60 year old female who had pain in the joints of her hands. And the first thing in the clue in the history is that it is pain is usually present in the evening. So as opposed to the morning pain or as opposed to the pain, which is more stiffness and getting better with the activity. Um, then she thinks that her hands are starting to look like those of her grandmother. So that may be an important clue there. Um, and then uh, in terms of the systemic uh, symptoms, she denies anything else. Uh, so there is no fever, there is no rash, there is no diarrhea, there is no uh, GU complaints, no dysuria and so forth. Uh, and then on the exam, uh, if you recall, she had these bilateral proximal interphalangeal and distal interphalangeal bony enlargement. And there was tenderness, but there is no warmth or swelling. And uh, when you ask her to close her fist, which will be the active range of motion, she was able to completely close her fist and then her hand grip was normal. Um, so now looking at the joint, now you can see that the both the PIP joint, uh, which is the joint over here, and the DIP joint, uh, which is joint over here, are swollen and they're very bony, knobby type of joints. Whereas you look at the MCP joints here, they look pretty, fairly normal here. And then some of the even PIP joints here they don't look uh, too bad. So again, the, the pattern of involvement is somewhat asymmetrical, but uh, the most of the small, small joints of the hands are involved. And now um, looking at the X-ray again, uh, when you look at the DIP joint on the X-ray, there's a marked destruction of the joint. And if uh, maybe, I'm not sure how well this is projecting, but if you look at the joint here, that's a fairly normal joint. So when you compare this joint, with this joint or this joint, you can see that how the normal joint looks like and how the abnormal joint where there is so much destruction of the joint is present. And then again, the alignment is clearly not there. Um, and then again, there is another example of the PIP joint uh, getting destroyed. And as compared to the somewhat normal appearing joint right next to it is the joint where uh, there is not so much disruption. So with this, Uh, you are already it's a non-inflammatory type of arthritis, uh, which is fairly common and, and uh, mostly seen in the older ages, but it can be seen in relatively younger middle-aged people also. Uh, and the specific type of osteoarthritis and which mean, we, mean we don't have time to go into is this uh, erosive kind of osteoarthritis, which is very more destructive type of arthritis and sometimes can be uh, missed. taken for rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, so now um, going to the next patient. So let's go to our second patient who is also uh, presenting to uh, the outpatient area. So now this patient is a 20 year old female and uh, she's complaining of pain and stiffness in her hands and wrists. And uh, this uh, pain started about four months ago. The symptoms duration is more than six weeks. 
and pain is usually worse in the morning. And she also complains of this stiffness, uh, which is lasting for about an hour and it gets improved with movement. Uh, also complains of an associated symptoms of feeling fatigued and tired. Uh, when you examine her, then you see that the wrist uh, on both sides are swollen and tender. Uh, you also see that some of the, the MCP joints, uh, which are the joints where the fingers are attached to your hand, uh, and uh, the PIP joints are also tender and swollen. Um, and, but you do not see any obvious deformity. And when you look at her hands, this is how it looks like. So on the first look, it may appear rather normal, but when you do a close look up, then you see that the wrist uh, has lost its markings. As you can see the arrow, the, there is so much fullness of the wrist joint. And maybe if you look at your own wrist, you will see that there is a marked difference from how your wrist looked like and how this patient's wrist looked like. So seemingly normal, but it is not normal. And then again, you look at the, um, the MCP joint, the metacarpophalangeal joint, and again, there is some swelling and the normal markings of the uh, MCP joint where you see the skin is usually wrinkled is not there. And then again, also there is some subtle swelling at the PIP joint, and you can see that the PIP area is a little bit swollen, and it's different than, than the neighboring joints if you, uh, if you compare it with the joint next to it. And when you do the x-ray, uh, the x-ray is uh, on the first look, look very normal. And some people can maybe uh, say that there is nothing wrong with the x-ray. But when you look at it more closely, you will see that there is a finding which is called the periarticular osteopenia. Uh, but you do not see any erosions. And what do we mean by that? So when you look at the periarticular area, which is this area right of the bone, which is right next to the joint, you see that the area is much more darker whereas this area is much more uh, opaque. So that means that there is a osteopenia uh, right next to the joint area. So this is called the periarticular osteopenia. But when you look at the joint surface, when you look at the joint closely, there are no erosions. So joints are pretty smooth and uh, there's a good preserved joint spaces, except for this uh, somewhat subtle finding of the periarticular osteopenia. So uh, what does that mean? Um, so right now you're still trying to learn about it. So what do you do is that you order some labs. Uh, so I'm just showing some of the abnormal labs and of course more labs are ordered, but, they, but in the interest of time and for this discussion, I'm not showing everything. So when you look at the ESR or the erythrocyte sedimentation rate, it is uh, 48, which is high, especially for a 28, year old female. Uh, you ordered a test called rheumatoid factor and the test which is somewhat obscured uh, but it's been very increasingly used um, and it's the anti-cyclic citrullinated peptide uh, antibody or anti-CCP antibody or another acronym for that is ACPA or ACPA antibody and then that value is also very high it's more than 250. So you see these three abnormal values use. So now uh, the question is that what is the diagnosis? So I think uh, most of you have already guessed by now what is the diagnosis and you also may recall the how things are different in this patient as compared to the patient uh, that we have uh, discussed the first time. So the diagnosis is rheumatoid arthritis but uh, in parenthesis is early stage and the reason I wanted to emphasize this point is that um, this patient may be uh, signed off as uh, just having some mild swelling or joint pain and may not get the proper attention that she deserves uh, because the findings are somewhat subtle. Uh, and then uh, these, are, these are the findings of the early rheumatoid arthritis. Again, the, the symptoms have been present for more than six weeks. So that is an important point that you don't want to diagnose somebody before six weeks. But if, the, if this, for this, for example, in this patient, when it has already been four months, uh, then you do want to uh, make sure that you order the proper labs and then you start the right kind of treatment for this patient. So what is rheumatoid arthritis? So rheumatoid arthritis, uh, very briefly, again, you need a lecture or maybe lectures to, uh, to learn about rheumatoid arthritis, but I'm just giving you the very 
uh, simmer down uh, version of uh, what rheumatoid arthritis is. So it's a chronic progressive inflammatory autoimmune disease. So it's the inflammatory type of arthritis as compared to the osteoarthritis, which is a non-inflammatory type of arthritis. And it's an autoimmune disease because uh, the disease is uh, caused by a dysregulation of immune system where the immune system uh, loses its distinction between what is the self protein versus the foreign protein and it starts to attack the self protein in the joint causing uh, this joint destruction and inflammatory process. And now uh, most of the time uh, it affects the small joints of the hands and feet, wrist and ankle and most of the time it's uh, symmetrical. So again, pattern recognition as we talked about earlier is important. And again, uh, the symptoms should be present for more than six weeks. And the morning stiffness, uh, as in this case, was about an hour. So the morning stiffness should be present for more than 30 minutes. The swelling and tenderness of the joint with reduced range of motion in the more advanced stages, but it could be normal range of motion in the somewhat early stages. For example, in this patient where it was uh, not so much uh, compromise in the range of motion, but there was swelling and tenderness of the joint, as you may recall from the um, joint examination that I've showed you and the x-rays that I showed you. So this is a little bit more advanced type of arthritis. And as you can see that in this case, the joint is also already destroyed. So this is the typical erosions that you will see in rheumatoid arthritis. So this, this erosion is present uh, when you see something like this, the diagnosis is uh, almost certain to be rheumatoid arthritis. So when there are erosions on x-rays, it's pathognomic for the diagnosis of RA. Uh, and then um, up to 80% of the patients with RA will have erosions uh, within the first three months. So it's uh, fairly common and it happens fairly fast. So patients may not have an obvious deformity on the examination, but when you do the x-ray, they may already showing signs of erosion as early as three months after the start of the symptoms. Um, but the early disease uh, may not show anything. For example, in this patient, uh, when we looked at the first x-ray, it showed only periarticular osteopenia with some soft tissue swelling, but there were no uh, joint erosions. Uh, so that's an important distinction that we need to make sure that we uh, look at the patient in terms of history, in terms of labs and x-ray, and then uh, come to the diagnosis, uh, how we did for this patient. The other important thing uh, about rheumatoid arthritis is to understand the various lab abnormalities. Since it's an inflammatory condition, so the ESR, which is a marker of uh, active inflammation, will be often elevated in this case. And the other marker that I have not listed here is the C-reactive protein or CRP, which is also elevated in cases of rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, the second thing is the rheumatoid factor and rheumatoid factor uh, is very often checked in the outpatient setting when patients come in for the joint pain. So you, we have to understand some of the limitations and when it is helpful and when it is not helpful. So for example, uh, so what is the rheumatoid factor? So it's the antibody which is uh, directed against the FC portion of the immunoglobulin G or IgG uh, and it's usually an IgM type of uh, of an antibody. So what is rheumatoid factor? It's an actually an antibody against another antibody because you have the, because of the autoimmune process. And uh, in about 20% of the patients with RA, it could be undetectable. Uh, it can be present in other diseases as well. And so it's not very specific for rheumatoid arthritis, other rheumatic and non-rheumatic diseases. And more importantly, it can also be present in up to 20, up to 10% of the healthy individual. And this percentage, uh, the 10%, uh, it can range and as low as 3% in young people, but as pa patients um, progress in the age, the percentage of the patients uh, who are healthy or who do not have rheumatoid arthritis, their percentage of having a positive rheumatoid factor increases. So um, the point here is that rheumatoid factor is helpful, but uh, having a positive rheumatoid factor does not make somebody have rheumatoid arthritis or does not get diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. And that's one of the mistakes that you will commonly see that based on a positive rheumatoid factor, patients will, people will say that this patient has rheumatoid arthritis, which is not the case because you have to have the other 
signs and symptoms and x-ray findings and so forth as we just discussed before you would diagnose somebody with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and then uh, the new kid on the block or new test, uh, which is not so new, but uh, relatively new, is the anti-cyclic uh, citrullinated peptide or anti-CCP or ACPA. Uh, and this test is very specific. Uh, so it's present in about 96% of the patient. So if you order anti-CCP in, in a patient who is having symptoms suggestive of rheumatoid arthritis, and even though the x-rays are not showing anything, but if the anti-CCP is positive in the patient with the right setting, um, it's almost 96% uh, sure that uh, presence of the of uh, CCP is, uh, is pathognomic or is diagnostic for rheumatoid arthritis. However, the sensitivity is uh, not so high, so it's about 67%. So uh, if uh, you order a CCP and antibody test in somebody who you are suspecting of having rheumatoid arthritis, uh, about 33% of those patients may still not have a positive CCP antibody. So the presence of CCP antibody in the right patient is helpful and will almost uh, be certain that the diagnosis is the rheumatoid arthritis, now, whereas the non-detection of CCP, or if you don't see the CCP being positive, is still you cannot say that patient does not have rheumatoid arthritis. So that's uh, important point about uh, RA factor or rheumatoid factor or anti-CCP and ESR. So um, let's uh, fast forward for a few years and see what has happened to the patient who initially presented when she was 20 years old. So if you recall when uh, she presented when she was 20 years old, this is how her hands look like. And now you are seeing her a few years later and this is how her hands look like. So a really uh, terrible and horrible looking hands. And obviously uh, the quality of life has uh, compromised and uh, she also is not able, uh, is uh, the disease not under control. And you can see that the joints are destroyed and they have various deformities, which you would read in your textbook and you will see a picture like that. So, uh, and when you do the X-ray, the initial X-ray looked like this. And now her x-rays look like this, where there is ulnar deviation. As you can see, that the joints are deviated to the side here. And then you also see some erosions. So uh, what are the uh, points to remember here is that uh, you are looking at the inflammatory versus non-inflammatory. Again, the duration is either less than or more than six weeks. Uh, the morning stiffness is more than 30 minutes. Uh, they are, are worse or improved with activity. They are an associated symptoms. You recognize the pattern involvement. Look at the joint warmth, swelling, and deformities. Look at the x-rays. Uh, do the labs, ESR, rheumatoid factor, ACPA. Uh, in terms of uh, the management goals, uh, you know that the R is highly progressive and destructive disease, as you see in this patient. Uh, however, uh, this uh, can be prevented. So if you diagnose and manage these patients at an early stage and an early onset, the joints can be preserved and it can prevent the disability and the quality of the life can be a better quality of life for the patient. So when you look at this uh, progression, uh, you want to make sure that uh, you diagnose the patients when they look like this and not when they look like this. Uh, because uh, you don't want your patients to, uh, to go to this uh, stage. Now, whereas with the rheumatoid arthritis, the joint may or hand may look like normal, but uh, with some subtle findings and x-rays and the labs, you want to make sure that the diagnosis is here and not when the patients are already progressed to this stage. Okay, so now we have discussed about the osteoarthritis and we have discussed about the rheumatoid arthritis. Now uh, let's go to our third patient. So this third patient today is the one I, uh, is presenting with the urgent care or the emergency room. So the first two were the outpatients uh, who come to a routine clinical visit, but this is, seems like there's something more serious going on. So let's find out what's going on. Then the other category of the monoarticular arthritis are the crystal induced. Uh, and the two broad categories are either gout or the cousin of the gout, which is called the pseudogout. And then 
Um, the other categories are the immune mediated. So um, things like reactive arthritis, things like psoriatic arthritis, and what we have just discussed, rheumatoid arthritis can also even present as a monoarticular arthritis. And then there's a miscellaneous category such as heme arthrosis, uh, especially in uh, patients who are on anticoagulation or who are on, uh, who have some kind of a clotting factor deficiency like hemophilia, they will come up with heme arthrosis. Uh, certain tumors, uh, especially certain tumors which are very specifically involved, the knee joint, uh, there is also a possibility. A meniscal tear uh, can also present as a monoarticular arthritis and osteonecrosis where the part of the joint or part of the bone uh, dies, uh, that is also uh, can present as monoarticular arthritis. Um, so what do you need to do next for this patient? So the patient is in the emergency room complaining of this right swollen pain, full knee joint. Uh, so uh, you order the x-rays, you uh, order some routine labs, trying to understand what's going on. But the most important thing is to do arthrocentesis. So the arthrocentesis of the knee joint, of course, it needs some practice and uh, you would need to, um, to learn how to do this. So it's not something that anybody can do, but uh, in, a, in a clinical setting, that is something, especially if you're doing your rheumatology rotations, you need to make sure that you do learn how to do the arthrocentesis. So when you stick a needle in the joint, when you do the arthrocentesis, you want to get the fluid out and there are three important things that we need to do for this is to look at the cell count, look at uh, how many WBCs are there and uh, whether they are the neutrophils or whether they are lymphocytes and so forth. Uh, and also send the fluid for gram stain and culture to see if it is gram positive or gram negative. And also culture takes some time. It will take two to three days uh, for culture to come back or in cases of TB, it may take even four weeks to come back. So you, make, you want to make sure that you send out four cultures. And then you also want to look at the crystals. So you want to see if uh, the, under the crystal analysis, if it is a needle-shaped crystal, which is negatively birefringent, then it's indicative for, for gout. If it is more of a rectangular type of or rhomboid shape of crystal, then which is positively birefringent, then it is more consistent with the pseudogout. Um, and then uh, also uh, because the septic arthritis, uh, if there is a presumptive diagnosis, it could be a very destructive uh, process. So within uh, a week or so, the joint can be completely destroyed. So you want to make sure that uh, if you're suspecting somebody having septic arthritis, having infectious etiology, then you want to start them empirically on antibiotic. And most commonly, we would uh, recommend that patients should be on parenteral antibiotic rather than oral antibiotic. So if uh, the suspicion or if the gram stain is coming back as gram positive cocci, then uh, the treatment will be vancomycin. If it is more of a gram negative cocci, then uh, the third generation cephalosporin, uh, for example, like ceftriazone or something would be, an, would be a good choice. Or sometimes people will, uh, if the gram stains are not back and if, or if you're not sure if the lab did a good job, then what you would do is that you will put them on both uh, gram positive and gram negative coverage. Again, to make sure that uh, on, in a patient with your suspecting septic arthritis, you want to make sure that you start them on empiric antibiotics. So the take home message for the monoarticular arthritis is that one, if you're suspecting infections or you're not sure what's going on, make sure that uh, you ask somebody who knows how to do arthrocentesis or if you have learned how to do arthrocentesis, make sure you stick a needle and get the fluid out. Uh, look for crystals, look for, do the gram stain, look for the cell count. And also if the suspicion is high for the septic arthritis, then make sure that to start the empiric antibiotics and not wait for cultures or not wait to make a full diagnosis. So uh, when you're thinking of uh, arthritis, uh, which is secondary to infection, uh, need to start patients on broad spectrum antibiotic coverage. So with that, um, I would end here, and I hope that you've learned uh, something about uh, how to differentiate between various kinds of arthritis, and how do you ask questions in the history, and what do you look for X on physical exam and x-ray and labs, and also uh, when it is more of an urgent case of arthritis versus where it is more of a 
uh, indolent case where you can wait a little bit before you make the diagnosis or you have some more time to uh, to sort of uh, understand what's going on with the patient so so depend on what is going on with the patient in terms of history and physical and what what is your differential diagnosis it's important to act now or versus act later and again uh, rheumatoid arthritis you want to diagnose patients early so they don't want to go into a deformities which are fixed deformities and had a significant impairment in their quality of life and patient may not be able to function so you want to make sure that you diagnose them at an early stage and um, with that i would say thank you so much for your attention and thank you for the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present and uh, this uh, is uh, an activity which was supported by the jsm yuana or the genus in medical university uh, association of uh, uh, north america and i would like to end by saying thank you very much